Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this Family Bible Study Hour. We're ready to get back into our Father's Word. Very important that you understand the 17th chapter of Ezekiel. We got 13 verses into it in the last lecture. And remember, it was a parable given by our Father directly to Ezekiel. No in-betweens. Directly to Ezekiel. It was a parable and a riddle concerning how it would be that the king of Babylon would come to power and, quite frankly, how he would be defeated after all is said and done. And the events that would transpire while he was in power. And it's very important to you today, and as much as you live in that peril, that time, that generation of the parable of the fig tree, because these self-same things will play again. Can we use that terminology? In other words, this was only a type, and when the king of Babylon of the great book of Revelation comes into being, this is how it will be. God stated to uh, the children, his children, you're going into captivity, captivity for 70 years. But you had soothsayers and priests that said, no, nah, it's not going to happen that way. It never happened. Well, it did. And then he spoke of how they leaned on Pharaoh after Nebuchadnezzar took many of the captives and, and left Zedekiah there as king so that it would be a, a, I mean, he didn't hate Israel. He didn't hate Jerusalem. He wanted it to survive, but he didn't want it to grow to be a great power whereby it would be a threat to him. So <clears throat> God said, then to, to Ezekiel, do you think these people that think it's not going to come to pass the way I said it would are going to prosper? And of course, the lesson you're to learn from it, anytime you go against God, you're out of business. You're going to flop flat on your face all the way down. So in as much as we have got to the 13th verse, let's pick it up there and uh, take our Father's word as he continues telling how they will fail if they go against him. Chapter 17, the book of Ezekiel, verse 13, and hath taken of the king's seed, the king did this, the Nebuchadnezzar, and made a covenant with him, and hath taken an oath of him, he hath also taken the mighty of the land. In other words, Nebuchadnezzar, through his guards, had the mighty of the land taken, but he left Zedekiah and made a covenant saying, I'll leave you alone. You go ahead and operate this country as you see fit. And you're going to be here 70 years. Of course, Nebuchadnezzar didn't tell him 70 years, but he should have known that from the prophet uh, Jeremiah. All right. Now, verse 14. And incidentally, if you take an oath and Zedekiah did to the king, then he should not have broken that oath in as much as it did not disagree with God's plan. All right, that's important to, that you weigh those words. 14, that the kingdom might be based, that is to say it would remain small, that it might not lift itself up to some great power, but that by keeping of his covenant, it might stand. It wouldn't be destroyed. And that's really, uh, you know, Nebuchadnezzar, uh, who, what does his name mean anyway? Nebo, the God of learning. And he really, he put Daniel and a few other of the uh, king line right in his own best schools and educated them. And Daniel would later be Nebuchadnezzar's um, number one tax collector. He would be in charge of the land, though he was a prisoner. Uh, so, and Nebuchadnezzar having written the fourth chapter of Daniel, one of the most beautiful prayers in God's word. So that should let you know that the compassion showing through him lets us know that, that it is not the king of Babylon that we will see in the end times, that, but it was a type. The king of Babylon in the end times is the king of confusion, which is none other than Satan himself. Nebuchadnezzar wanted the nation to stand, 15, but he rebelled. Zedekiah couldn't handle it. He rebelled against him in sending his ambassadors into Egypt. 
Now God's kind of explaining the parable here for those that might not have caught on. That they might give him horses and such people, and much people rather. Shall he prosper? Question. You should know the answer, friend. Don't ever overlook it. It's against God's plan that he would go to Pharaoh to overthrow Nebuchadnezzar. So the answer is he's going against God. He's going to fall flat on his face. Shall he escape that doeth such things? Question. No. Or shall he break the covenant and be delivered by breaking not necessarily Nebuchadnezzar's plan, but God's plan? And of course, ultimately he will die for it. Verse 16. As I live, saith the Lord God, surely in the place where the king dwelleth that made him king, that's Babylon, whose oath he despised and whose covenant he broke, even with him in the midst of Babylon he shall die. And he would ultimately. He would, he would run away. Uh, this is all recorded in the book of Kings. He would be caught and his eyes gouged out, and he would be led in chains blind to Babylon. He'd never actually see it. And then he would be killed there, but his son's killed right in front of him. Verse 17. Neither shall Pharaoh with his mighty army and great company make for him in the war by casting up mounts and building forts to cut off many persons in other words, now, now break this right back, if you would, down to the nitty-gritty. God has already told the children, you'll be all right. I will bring you out after 70 years, and you will prosper. But it, that is how it's going to be. So when Zedekiah turned from the flow of God's plan us using the king of Babylon and turns to Nebuchadnezzar, uh, to Pharaoh rather, and breaks his covenant. Who is he leaning upon? God? Of course not. He's leaning upon man. And the man he lived, leaned upon was a fantastic king. Power, horses, people. I mean, a great force. A force, no doubt, that possibly could have made a great difference but it was against God's plan. So it wasn't about to happen. What does that teach you? Follow your father's plan. Your father is in control. It will improve your life today. It will give, gain you strength. You don't have to be afraid of anything when you're in your father's word. That is to say, utilizing common sense, of course. and. But don't, do not, that is to say, never go against God's plan or you're going to lose. Verse 18, seeing he despised the oath by breaking the covenant, and we're talking about Zedekiah breaking the covenant with uh, Nebuchadnezzar, when lo, he had given his hand and hath done all these things, he shall not escape. Why? He will die. In other words, he gave his word. You know, I can remember back when a handshake was all that was necessary to close some very large contracts. There are many things today that I still operate in that same way. But I certainly know who I'm dealing with. And if, if those individuals who have proven themselves trustworthy give you their hand, it's better than some people's contracts. So. Our Father blesses those that keep, when it's possible, their contracts. 19. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, as I live, this is very heavy, God swearing by himself, for certainly he lives, surely, listen to me, surely mine oath that he hath despised and my covenant that he hath broken even it will I recompense upon his own head. In other words, he had told him, you're going into captivity for 70 years. He utilized, though the covenant was made with Nebuchadnezzar, God in the book of Jeremiah calls Nebuchadnezzar his great servant. 
and um, and uh, he was a servant of God. God only utilized him. And then what would it be for the king of Babylon in the end times? Not 70, but only seven. And then even that would be shortened to a shorter period of time. We know to be five months from Revelation chapter 9, split into two parts of that great king. But you know it beforehand. You know it because it's written in God's Word. And I remember, and it is the beauty of our Father, that Christ Himself, I think this is one of the reasons He chose when asked about how often to forgive. Christ said, not just seven, but seven times seventy you forgive. And I thank God that he does forgive us when we do fall short from his plan. But as best you can, you'd better hang tough with his plan because that's the way it's going to be. As it is written, there will be a five-month period before the true Christ returns to gather anyone back to him. And during that five-month period, as it is written in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4, this spurious Messiah, just as he sit in Jerusalem on Mount Zion before, shall do it again, saying, I am Christ. I am Savior. I've come to haul you out of here. And those that are not educated in God's word, with his leading, to know there are two tribulations, and that first tribulation shall take place before anyone gathers back. They're going against God's plan the same as these people did. So you better stop listening to man and listen to your father's word. All right? Do not go against God. And there's only one way you can be certain of what God says, and that is to read his word for yourself. It is written, as Christ would say. Verse 20. And I will, this is God speaking now, not Nebuchadnezzar. God. And I will spread my net upon him, and he shall be taken in my snare. And I, why am I emphasizing my and I? It was Nebuchadnezzar's troops that captured him. No, God had him captured. God wasn't going to let him sneak out and run like a rabbit in the night. He intended to see that he paid the full price for breaking God's word, his plan, when he was in a position of leadership. And I will bring him to Babylon and will plead with him there for his trespass that he hath trespassed against me. Not Nebuchadnezzar, but against God. Now, my friend, this is a parable concerning the end times. And you had better settle it in your mind. Never go against that that is written that shall come to pass as far as the king of Babylon is concerned. It is God's plan, and God is in control. Our Father is in control. We don't have to worry about a thing. That does not mean that you shall not cast your vote and take part in everything that you have the freedom and the privilege to do. But you will not try to take things into your own hands to violate the word of God. A word to the wise is sufficient. My whole point being, and I don't want you to miss it, it wasn't Nebuchadnezzar and his troops that caused Zedekiah's eyes to be gouged out and him to be led and chained blind and then, mur and then killed in Babylon. It was God that caused it because Zedekiah turned on God, disobeyed him, broke every rule in the book, and leaned on man rather than our Heavenly Father. What, is, what am I saying? If you trust God, you'll always win, regardless of what it would appear following that that is written. You will always be blessed. You'll always be a winner. Verse 21. And all his fugitives with all his band shall fall by the sword, and they that remain shall be scattered toward all winds, and ye shall know that I, the Lord, hath spoken it. Now, there is a great deal in that verse that you must not miss. 
these sons, and this can be documented historically from the book of Kings and as well as uh, other places, Jeremiah. The sons, and uh, I believe it's ten, were all killed in Babylon. None of the daughters were taken. Jeremiah himself took the daughters, went into Egypt, and then later migrated to Great Britain, into Europe, what we today call Europe. And those three branches, those daughters, became the royalty that we have in Europe even at this time. The same lineage, the same lineage, blessed by God, protected by Jeremiah, he would later be buried in a tomb called Olin Fala. And uh, strange, but Olin Fala re retained his great secretary, Baruch, uh, right to the end. This is easily historically documented. It is how the stone of scone, the stone of destiny, is under the coronation chair because of those three daughters taken and scattered as God himself promised, he scattered toward all winds. Later, those migrations would take place. The Tsar of Russia was a part of that lineage, even the king, before his overthrow by the communist system, atheism. <clears throat> God's word is true. And when you take the time to check it out, to look at it, to examine to use a little wisdom and a little common sense, a little knowledge concerning God's Word, then you find that God's Word comes to pass exactly as it's written. The question is, how are you doing, friend? How familiar are you with your Father's Word? Verse 22, Thus saith the Lord God, I will also take of the highest branch what is the highest branch we have? God would say, I am a great fir tree in the Minor Prophets of the high cedar and will set it. I will crop off the top of his young twigs a tender one and will plant it upon a high mountain, an imminent. Uh, and that's why it is written in Isaiah chapter 53 verse 2 that Jesus was this branch, this sprout that was set upon this earth and we were ordered to call him Emmanuel and through which is to say God with us and it he was God with us he opened up the floodgate that w would need to be a floodgate to take care of the sins of the world uh, that in his crucifixion on that cross paying the price that upon repentance we could have that forgiveness wherever you were in this world of whatever people you were that tender branch became a powerful force but it was from the highest cedar from the highest fir evergreen is util utilized symbolically because it always has green leaves meaning ever living it's not like other trees where the leaves Frost hits them, they crinkle, they curl, they dissipate. Evergreen always has green leaves uh, and therefore used in this manner. That branch brought forth the salvation that without it, man would have surely a hard time finding salvation because we are weak and because we all fall short and again we can see why he that would say seven times seventy is the one that brings about our salvation now verse 23 in in the mountain of the height of Israel where is that Mount Zion we read about it back in the 16th chapter God's favorite place will I plant it and it sh that's Jerusalem to you and it shall bring forth boughs and bear fruit look in the mirror someday if you love him you're part of the fruit 
You're part of that fruit of that vine. And be a goodly cedar, and under it shall dwell all fowl of every wing. In the shadow of the branches thereof shall they dwell. Through him, I don't care what people you are. I don't care who you are. I don't care if you're even a Kenite. If you love him, if you come under that branch, by that I mean that you respect him, love him, and upon repentance accepted him as the son of God, born of a virgin in Bethlehem, as it is written, God's word never lies. God's word is always true. It is not difficult to appreciate his love or to find his love for us in the fulfillment of his word. You cannot count on man. Man will disappoint you. But God's word will never disappoint you. It comes to pass exactly as it's written. That tender branch will never disappoint you because that plant, Emmanuel, planted in Mount Zion, departed from the high peak on Mount of Olives, will return to that selfsame peak and will reclaim that that is his. Verse 24. And all the trees of the field shall know that I, the Lord, hath brought down the high tree, exalted the low tree, have dried up the green tree, and have made the dry tree to flourish. Listen to that. Dry tree is a dead tree. I, the Lord, have spoken and have done it. And of course, that is through spiritual salvation, of course. There is so much in that verse. When we come to the, the 31st chapter of this great book of Ezekiel, you're going to understand what the high tree was that was destroyed. Because it's the self-same king of Babylon that is yet future. Don't worry, I'll remind you of it when we get there. But what is this business about the green tree and the dry tree? That should bring, that should click in your mind a prophecy. That should click in your mind the words of Jesus Christ in that great book of Luke. I believe it's the 23rd chapter. The words of Christ as he would come as, yes, 23 verse 28 of Luke. I want to read it to you. You'll have it on your character generator. Christ's words. He's carrying the cross. Blood dropping down his forehead as he has the crown of thorns pressed heavily down upon him. And the women along the way, the path, were crying. Tears streaming down their cheeks. He was on his way to be nailed to that cross and to die a fleshly death. Was he weeping? No, he was teaching. Listen. But Jesus turning unto them said as they wept, Daughters of Jerusalem, weep not for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. That's umbilical cord to umbilical cord to this generation. 29. For behold, the days are coming, and I will even say are here, in the which they shall say, Blessed are the barren in the wombs that never bear, and the paps that never gave suck. And of course, this has to do with the virgin bride of Christ at his return. As it is written in Mark 13, woe to those that are with child when I return and that give suck. In other words, it is a spiritual saying and it means they married the spurious Messiah rather than waiting as a virgin bride for the true Christ. Why? Because they had been told they would be sucked out of here in a big whirlwind. And when the first spurious supernatural Messiah shows up, they nurse, that's what, nurse along his work. Verse 30, he continues. In other words, you better weep for yourself. Why? The, uh, the explanation given. 30, then 
shall they begin to say to the mountains, fall on us and to the hills, cover us. Why? They were good Christian people. They were just biblically illiterate and worshiped the wrong Messiah and they're too ashamed to face the true Christ. 31. For if they do these things to a green tree, if they will do this to me, the high sprig, taken from the low tree, if they will do this to me in my flesh body, <clears throat> what shall be done in the dry? In other words, what will they do to the Holy Spirit? I don't know. That's up to you because we're talking about the unforgivable sin there for those that know. For those that are in ignorant, I suppose they will remain ignorant, illiterate. But our Father knows the choice is yours. It is not necessarily your minister's fault that you do not understand the Word of God. If, if you go there and he's a one verse, Charlie, you still have the Word. And we live in a generation that most people are educated whereby they can read. If not, for that reason, God sends gifted teachers that you can trust to properly interpret that word with its meaning and emotion from our Father's heart brought forth to you, whereby you have a choice. And the choice is yours. Jesus himself, even while paying the price, again with that blood running down his forehead, thought of you in this generation. I think it's precious. We're going into the 18th chapter. It's a beautiful chapter and we won't go very far into it, but I want this to put to rest in your mind one and for all times. Is it true that if a father sins, the sin comes out in a child? Do children pay for their parents' sin. Now, a lot of people, I get many, many questions about this. And the answer always remains the same. No way. Absolutely no way does a child pay for its parents' sin. Many parents get themselves on a terrible guilt trip. <clears throat> does it mean they don't believe God's word? Well, I would say so. I mean, it's very clear what our father's feelings are about it. And they still want to say, well, if I had been better, God wouldn't have caused my child to do that. It doesn't work that way, friend. God will show you three generations in this chapter. Hopefully, you believe God's word. And rather than being a worry wart or a guilt trip uh, expert that always, uh, an expert on a guilt trip is one that keeps his bags packed all the time and is traveling, always on guilt. Repentance is good for the soul. But a child, hear me, a child never, but never pays for the sins of a parent. Chapter 18, verse 1. The word of the Lord came unto me again, saying, Two, what mean ye? What are you talking about here? That you use this proverb concerning the land of Israel, saying, the fathers have eaten, the sour, or sour, have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge. What, are, what do you mean? What is this proverb that the children have to pay for their father's sins? And he's indicating here, it's really silly. Verse 3, now get this real good coming out the gate and the rest of the chapter will be a breeze for you. As I live, now if you don't believe this when God says that, you're hopeless, all right? God is swearing by his own name to drive this point to the very quick. As I live, saith the Lord God, ye shall not have occasion any more to use this proverb in Israel. What he's saying here, I'm going to set this straight in your mind for one and all times. It's amazing to me how many churches will, uh, will tell people, according to the questions I get, 
while that poor child is because the parents sinned. They just sinned and there the child is. And, and you deeper scholars that are into Hebrew and know what a mamzar is. Not even in that case. And as it is written in Exodus chapter 20, 21, the Ten Commandments. Unto the fourth generation, those that hate God, this shall continue. Well, of course it will. If they hate God, the generation below, if they still hate him, I don't care if it's 150 generations. That would be quite a few. <laughs> as long as they hate God, it's still going to be that way. If you love God, any one generation can change it just like that, okay? Now, God said, I want to put a stop to this saying that uh, the father eats the sour grape and the child tastes it. All right? It doesn't happen that way. Verse 4, behold, all souls are mine. You thought it was yours, didn't you? Yes, it's my little darling. The soul belongs to me. No, it doesn't. God created that soul. He's the father of it. He only loaned it to you for a little bit. All souls are mine as the soul of the father. So also the soul of the son is mine. Probably created them at the same time anyway. They're the same age spiritually. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. It doesn't matter whether it's grandpap, pap, or the, or the little one. Each one answers for himself. There is no in-between. Everyone, and God said everyone, and he's putting this, you couldn't ask him to put it any more on an indiv individual plane than to say, they all belong to me. Did you know that your soul belongs to him? Do you know that he created your soul for his pleasure? And in creating this great earth, that he made things real nice for us? And man continues leaning on man instead of him? And that when your parents conceived, that soul entered the womb of your mother a soul from above. That's why the true translation of John chapter 3 is of what people say, are you barren again? Well, it's the Greek is born from above. It's a little more, uh, you know, than what man can tag on it himself. The soul comes from above, and in being born from above, you recognize the father is your father, and you come back into his family Instead of some church system or some family here ignoring God. Doesn't work that way. Your soul, whether you like it or not, belongs to God. And it is his to give eternal life to or let it be damned in hell. It's his duty to send it one place or the other. But your destination is decided by you your choice what do you decide he that owns your soul do you love him enough to study his word to care what he says or, or are you happy listening to some one verse Charlie give a 20 minute lecture sometime on maybe a weekend Saturday or a Sunday and make a lot of traditions known to you but never quite getting around to teaching the word of God I don't know the choice is yours friend I know what the outcome will be, and don't miss this chapter, because I assure you, when we finish it, you'll never have to ask, the, those that hear it will never have to ask the question again, do children pay for the sins of their parents, or vice versa? You will know the answer straight from the heart of God. Don't miss it. All right, bless your heart. You listen a moment, won't you please?